by just today is Stephen Hopkins, who's coming out in 2025 with a book called Translating Hell, Vernacular Theology, and Apocrypia in the Medieval North Sea. I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. But you, if you don't know Stephen Hopkins, he's absolutely a joy to follow on Twitter. But this week, we are going to discuss some old English history and the most uh, not so famous, but kind of famous, venerable deed. And of course, Bede is one of the most important sources. We discussed it before that Bede is one of the most important sources we have in early English history in that, that era that writes from in Middle Ages. And, but how you're mainly a linguist yourself on in old English. So how did what was it that about old English and that attracted you so much? Yeah, sure. Well, first off, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to actually get to talk to one of my Twitter mutuals. Um, you yeah. know, we're always joking around about linguistics and old English and all this stuff. So it's it's nice to actually have the conversation. Um, but yeah, so like my journey with with old English in particular, um, really started by accident. Um, I didn't know old English existed until I went to college. I um, started out wanting to major in anthropology because I wanted to be an archaeologist. Um, but it quickly became apparent, you know, after that first semester's classes that I would not really thrive in archaeology. Um, I don't Too like much generally. Stuff. Yeah, I don't like <laughs> being outside all that much. I'm sort of a great indoorsman. Um, I don't like getting messy and I hate jigsaw puzzles. And that's what a lot of, you know, archaeologists are out there digging in the mud, looking for little shards of stuff to piece back together. So it's kind of like my own personal hell uh, when you think about it that way. Um, <laughs> so I had to pivot. Um, but part of the anthropology program was linguistic anthropology. And from there, I sort of switched to linguistics as a track in general. And that was where I was like, aha, like, you know, in high school, I'd already taken Spanish, Latin and Greek. And I knew I loved foreign languages. Um, so that that really sort of let me spread my wings. But as part of the linguistics major, one of the first classes that they had us take uh, this was at Miami University in Ohio um, near Cincinnati. Um, one of the first classes that they had you take in that program was a history of the English language class. And I absolutely fell in love with the subject. Uh, that was the first time I saw Old English. My professor, Patrick Murphy, um, he, you know, gave us short, easy to read text, you know, things like the Lord's Prayer or Bible stories or whatever to try to read. Um, and even though we didn't know the language, like I was just absolutely fascinated with how similar, but like how strangely different it was. I could understand parts of it, but some of the vocabulary was just like so, so eye-opening and different to me. So I was hooked. After that, you know, I, um, I kind of finished the anthropology degree half-heartedly with my eye on medieval the whole time. So by the time I got to my senior thesis, that was where I was like, you know what, I'm going to pivot. I'm just going to go all in medieval. I'm going to take, you know, a medieval Latin class. There was a Beowulf class offered. They let me into the Old English grad class as an undergrad. And so like, I just went all in. I wrote my thesis on the Old English Exodus, um, which pretty much turned into my first uh, academic article on, on Exodus um, and sort of what's going on in that biblical epic poem um so yeah so my re my route to old english is very circuitous um and my route to be is equally circuitous right because you know i'm primarily a literature guy like you said literature and, and a little bit of linguistics um i'm not a historian so if if any uh if any of my colleagues in old english history have any quibbles with what i say it's not my fault um <laughs> My liter literature is really my my uh, home area, but I'm happy to talk about Bede because he does a lot of cool literary things in the ecclesiastical history. I will just discuss Bede in in a in a second, but I just want to add that Bede, if you are, especially if you are an atheist, like in very atheist person, Bede might not be for everyone, and it can be quite a tedious read because there's a lot of praise him about. And we don't want to get into this, so. Christianity is the right religion, and how uh, there's a lot of praise in uh, pro Christianity and propaganda, to put it for lack of better words. But it, so it might not be for everyone. It's not, and it's not necessarily a page, what we would call a page turner today. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, I always warn my students, you know, like when we're reading ancient historical texts, like you've got to remember that they're 
you need to be more patient, right? You got to slow down and read it more slowly. Their narrative style is necessarily not the same as ours, right? They didn't, um, you know, the 19th century really uh, changed English stylistically, right? And so we try to write in a more fast paced way. So I don't know that we can hold be that against Bede per se. Um, I also, but I do know what you mean when, you know, Bede does praise Christianity a lot, um, which might not be shocking for someone whose entire life, you know, he's a monk. He's lived in the monastery since he's seven years old. Um, he he loves him some Bible, right? I mean, if you look at the corpus of his writings, um, I, sh I guess I should take a step back and say, at the end of the ecclesiastical history, he gives us just the brief briefest little bi autobiographical note where he tells us a little bit about his life. He tells us that he was born near the monasteries, um, that he was given as an oblate when he is seven years old, um, and that he pretty much spent his whole life at the monastery. I mean, he traveled a little bit. He went to York once or twice. Some of his letters suggest that he traveled to a few other monasteries in the region, but he never really went further than York or maybe Iona. Um, or, sorry, maybe Lindisfarne. Um, anyway, the point is he stayed pretty local. Um, Nevertheless, he, oh, I was going to say he, uh, as part of his little autobiography, he lists all the works that he wrote and numerically half of what he, and it, it was a lot. I mean, B was prolific in his day. He would be considered prolific in our day, right? Like it's incredible how much writing this guy turned out. Um, a lot of it is biblical exegesis, um, which is just, you know, a fancy word for explaining to people people how to properly interpret these these narratives right so um so i think that right there kind of shows you just how passionate he was about the importance of the bible and and how he thought that he could make people's lives better by helping them to understand like what what it's about and how it relates to them right so so yes you're right modern atheists might not be super into be for that um but you know he's still an important historical source in general, right? Even if you're not into church, um, because well, he's one of our only sources for early medieval England, right? Mm -hmm. For for the old English speaking period, uh, and he's considered, you know, one of the greatest historians of the Middle Ages, possibly the great historian of the Middle Ages. So, mm -hmm. and, and let's that. let's talk about how important he actually is, because in this justice, I believe in our episode last year on Andrew Thatcher's, where you know, in the early time of the, uh, after Rome. The, most of the the Romans loses written of how there is no no historical writing, so there is really everything is in disarray, and you can you might go as far as calling the actual dark age, and you just see why people label it that way when you read about what that era was like. We mainly rely on archaeological evidence from that because we ha like I said, we have no almost no historical writings. The pagans didn't have a writing language until Christianity came. Pretty much, so it tells you a little bit about how how important Beard, who is almost the only, as far as I know, the only source we have for that historical era. Yeah, he's nearly the only extensive written source. I mean, there before Bede, one of his main, one of his Bede's own main sources that's local is a historian. Um, well, he's not really a historian. Um, we'll call him a priest, an eccentric priest called Gildas, um, who. Has, you know, he's in he's alive somewhere in the 500 to 550 range. We're not totally sure. Um, but he has this one long text called the De Ex Cidio on, on the fall and the ruin of Britain. Right. Um, and this is sort of um, a long screed, basically, about, you know, why the uh, Germanic tribes are coming over to England to dispossess the um, the Romano Britons. Right. This is after the Roman troops have more or less left England to its own devices uh, because, you know, Rome is having trouble. Um, so Gildas basically, it, it's a hard text to even read. Like if we want, if it were our only source, we could probably still consider it a fairly dark age, right? Because so much of like his writing style is, it's basically a pastiche of biblical verses in Latin, right? I mean, of course he's writing Latin, but I mean, it's basically, he just weaves together a lot of Bible verses to show how upset he is about like what you know and why he thinks that the well or well, you should call them the welsh at this point but these romano britons sort of deserve their fate right they've been bad christians and so that's why they're losing their land to these germanic uh heathens who are coming over um so like gildas is pretty much it up until bead um and then bead even like i said before even by medieval standards bead is a careful thoughtful historian um he doesn't just rely on 
I mean, he relies on written sources extensively, and he did have access to one of the great libraries of the early Middle Ages there at um, Monk Worm of Jero, um, that was put together by, by Benedict Bishop. Um, you know, so Bede has access to like this ma massive library of maybe three or 400 books. Um, he's, got, he's got historians like Eusebius, he's got historians like Erosius, um, so he can pick and choose from them. But he also goes the extra mile and he actually will interview people about, you know, local events. Yeah, there's a story about him tracking down Bishop Wilfred um, to investigate more about um, when St. Cuthbert's body was exhumed, for example, right? So he, he would actually travel locally and interview people to try to corroborate facts, compare stories, and try to like figure out what really happened, you know? So um, that's one reason why he's he was and continues to be held in pretty high esteem. And do we have, and I asked this about when we covered even Batuta a while ago, while ago he, we talked about the outside sources mentioning him, but do we have any outside sources or even in sources in the monastery mentioning Bede as a person and what it was like in the monastery? Because from my understanding, he kind of seems like a happy person and happy and helpful person, but do, do we have any sources verifying his life? And it's, of course, we know he's existent because of his book, but you know, do we have any sources that confirms his life there or writes about him as a person? Yeah, yeah, there, there's a little bit. Um, I mean, especially for someone who was alive 1,300 years ago and someone who wasn't a king or a bishop, right? Mm -hmm. um, we do have a decent amount of evidence about Bede. Um, we have his own letters, right? He, he corresponded with other, um, you know, monks and ecclesiastics across England pretty extensively. So like we have his letters going out to them, but then we also have some of the responses. Um, I believe he's mentioned, let me check, let me just double check. I believe he's actually mentioned by name in, um, as like one of two priests who are named Bede at the time in some church historical document. Uh, but I can't remember what that is off the top of my head. Um, and then of course his, um, he has a, this disciple, this this very ardent student named Cuthbert, um, who writes a short narrative about Bede's death, especially, right? Uh, you could tell that Cuthbert has a very, very high opinion of Bede. You know, he's writing almost this sort of proto-saint's life version of, of the account of Bede's death. Uh, he really loved Bede, which, you know, speaks to, I think speaks to Bede as a teacher, right? Um, generally, you have to be a pretty impressive educator to inspire that kind of devotion and loyalty. Um, but yeah, so we have Cuthbert's account. Uh, he sort of summarizes, he tells us a little bit about Bede's life. Um, he reports Bede's death song, which is quite interesting. He claims that Bede was very good, not only at Latin verse, um, which shouldn't shock us because Bede did write a metrical treatise, like how to write Latin poetry really well. Um, and it was, it was one of the popular go-to works for centuries. Um, but apparently he was also good at oral vernacular verse and he composed a song in old english poetry uh pretty decent old english poetry right it's like not outstanding but it's pretty good about his own death um so yeah so that information comes from cuthbert writing about him and actually uh depending on which edition of bead you're looking at now a lot of the modern editions will actually package cuthbert's life of, of bead as sort of an appendix at the back i know it's in the back of my low classical library version of, of bead um so yeah, so so there is some contemporary mentions of him, but it is worth pointing out too that I sort of alluded to it before. He didn't, he wasn't ambitious, right? At least not in terms of like worldly power. He was an ambitious writer and uh, intellectual, right? He wrote copiously, but he, um, as far as like seeking worldly power, and I will say that what I'm saying is a little speculative, but because we don't know tons about his background, but he, he, he tells us that he was born on the lands around the monastery, that he was his family gave him to be an oblate to the monastery when he was seven. That's typically something that would have been done by an upper class family, an aristocratic family. So there's we don't know for sure, but there's a good chance that he came from an aristocratic background. There are some early kings um, of, of some of these early English kingdoms that give us the name Bede. Right. So we know that it had been used before by some ancient rulers. Um, so he probably comes from that kind of background. 
nevertheless, um, let's see. So he's an Oblate at seven. At 19, he becomes a deacon, I believe. Um, whoops, there goes my lights. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> at 19, he becomes a deacon. Um, and then at 30, he becomes a priest. Uh, um, but there is no evidence that he tried to like climb the ladder any higher than that. He was happy to remain a priest and happy to remain a teacher um, and a preacher, basically, right? Um, that was where his passion was, a sort of helping people understand um, this this religion and, and these these literatures or you know uh, religious literatures that he loved so much. His life did seem kind of dull, to be honest, just being in the monastery and teaching preaching. It doesn't seem that exciting. Let, let's be fair. I mean, I mean at least to a mother's down there, it doesn't seem very exciting to to brag something. Nothing that you brag about, but in in mother's down there, it's a bit in that way. Well, everyone has their own taste, right? I mean, you're telling that to someone who's an academic who, uh, I mean, you can see my office right now, look kind of like a monastic <laughs> cell, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so. The, do we know if the monastery, what monastery he did work in? And like, is it still a Outstanding today, or is it mostly ruined? Can you can we find the monastery if we go to Britain? Can is yeah. it possible to locate this monastery? Well, he was at um Saint Peter. Well, okay, so he was actually at a twin monastery. So there were two monasteries that were um established by, I believe they were established by Benedict Bishop. Maybe you should fact check me on that. But I believe he um so Benedict Bishop is this um this early church leader who is just an avid book collector. Um, and so he goes to Rome basically and just spends tons of money trying to amass the best library that he possibly can um, and brings them back to England. Um, and I guess his collection of shiny, cool church books and objects um, was so impressive to the local king that he was given land for a monastery. So that first one would have been um, the monastery at Wearmouth. And then 10 years later, I think, um, he comes, but he's, he's built an even more impressive collection and the local rulers are like, man, we got to keep funding this guy. So they give him a second monastery that becomes sort of a, a, a sister institution. So it's, um, that's why when we say, you know, bead of monk Wermuth Jarrow, what we really mean is there were these two monasteries, Wermuth and one at Jarrow that are about 10 miles apart from each other um, that were basically the same institution, right? They were run by the same people. They collaborated constantly. Um, they were considered, you know, the, to be twin institutions. Um, one of them was dedicated to St. Peter. The other was dedicated to St. Paul. So that seems to be where Bede spent most of his time was just, you know, in that little 10 mile stretch. Um, let's see. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> It, what, happens. What, um, it happens. Well, I was going to ask what, uh, where, where are we going with that? Do we know if the monastery still stands today? The, the monastery okay. that Bede were, were living in, the, the Peter and Paul, not the Peter and Paul fortress, but Peter and Paul monasteries where he, where we talked about he, were, he was working most of the time. Is it still standing today or is it mostly ruined? Is it possible to locate them at all? I, I know it's not totally, I think parts of it still stand. Like, I think when, if you go to St. Peter's um, at Wearmouth, I believe is the one, um, I want to say that there is still a, a church standing there, but I think that the tower is supposed to be, um, we don't know exactly how old it is. It, it's called the Saxon Tower. So it was sometime from the old English period. I, I've heard it dated anywhere from the 7th to the 10th century. So that, that bit of the building might be from Bede's day, or it might be from, you know, a century or two later. Uh, but it is pre-conquest, pre-Norman. Um, so there is a bit of it. I don't know how much of the rest actually physically survives. Um, you know, there's definitely some remains. There's definitely, like, some crumbling walls, you know, <laughs> um, ruins. But uh, for the most part, like, we don't have, like, the whole, you know, just with as with pretty much every old English, uh, early English yeah. center of power, we don't have a lot of um, buildings that have survived fully intact. Hmm. So do you know uh, what, is, I think, I don't really remember if you spoke about this earlier, but do you know what point we decided that, hey, I'm going to try to write um, a classical history of the English people that's going to be a masterpiece for centuries 
<laughs> I don't know if you ever thought, hey, I want to write something that's going to be a masterpiece. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm trying to think. So it is sort of his magnum opus, right? It comes later. Um, and he finishes it to the, he finishes, I mean, obviously his death is um, kind of an end point, right? right? But I think he finishes it in 731. He dies a couple of years later, 735. I think I misspoke earlier. Um, I don't, let me think about it. When did they actually start writing it? I know he must have started writing it. Hmm. I know he's interviewing people. I mean, like Wilfred was alive some 20 years before that. Um, so I know he worked on it for many, many years. Um yeah, I'm guessing he must have started sometime at around 705, 710, and worked on it, you know, bit by bit. Um, again, I'm not a historian by specialty, so maybe I'm getting this wrong. Um, I'm actually scanning. I'm trying to scan a reference work to see if it tells us when he actually started it. It says he completed it in 731, so I was right about that. So the year, totally. supposedly to the year he died, he finished it right before. Yeah, so so he finishes it in 731 and he dies in 735, uh, some time in his early 60s, right? Um, which is a, a decent lifespan for that day and age. So let's begin with, with the actual book itself, their classical history, and, and let's just discuss the book, their classical history of the English people, because it does begin the book with the invasion of Julius Caesar in early 44. 45, which I don't remember the date in my head, but he does begin with the invasion of by Julius Caesar, which is a failure. It was, of course, a failure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. And this is one of those literary things that, you know, I that jumps out at me as a literary reader, right? Is Rome is very important to be in general. Right, mm -hmm. which was true for most people in late antiquity slash the early Middle Ages. Right, <laughs> um, Rome was a big deal. It continues to be a big deal. But for me, especially, like he starts the story of England with um, with Rome's first contact with with the land. Right, for him, that's more important than sort of the mists of time. Now, part of this is because he has a written source for mm -hmm. Julius Caesar. Right, Caesar writes yeah. this this little bit in at the end of Bellum Gallicum. Um, but yeah, so he starts out, I mean, Rome sort of always looms in the background of England's history, according to Bede. Um, and he has some he has some theological and some ideological reasons for that, um, which we can, I mean, we can talk about that if you want. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, you know, part of what he's doing, there's this awesome book by um, Andy Scheil, um, came out in, I don't know, 2004 or so, called The Foot's of Israel. And so part of what Bede is trying to do is show that England is a divinely appointed people, right? Um, that, that the English are. Um, he draws a lot of parallels, um, both in his ecclesiastical history and in another book that he writes called De Templo on, on the temple, uh, meaning the temple in Israel, the one that got destroyed. Um, and he he's at pains to show that, you know, England's history sort of mirrors um, Israel's history, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, according to the Hebrew scriptures, right, Israel starts out in slavery in Egypt, and then there's the, the narrative of the Exodus, right, where um, Moses leads them and, you know, the, the, the afflicts the plagues on Pharaoh, and then they escape from slavery, and they wander around in the wilderness, and eventually they're given the promised land. Um, that whole narrative, Bede thinks that that applies to the English as well. They start as pagans, um, maybe metaphorically enslaved. Um, in this promised land, and just like the Israelites, they dispossess the people who already lived there, right? Um, so the Canaanites are sort of, I mean, Bede doesn't come out and say this, but it is kind of implicit in his narrative, right? That, that just as the Canaanites are driven out of their land because they're unworthy, so too are the Romano Britons who are there. And you can see how he get that from Gildas, right? Because Gildas effectively says the same thing. Uh, um, but Bede takes it further. And so, you know, they, they're still not Christians at the point that they've taken the land. 
Um, it's only in 597, right? This is a major part of, of the beginning of Bede's uh, ecclesiastical history. In 597, Pope Gregory the Great sends um, the missionary Augustine, not not St. Augustine, right, but Augustine of Canterbury, um, up to England to, to start trying to convert these people. Um, and one of that story also starts in Rome, right? Supposedly, Pope Gregory is just walking through the markets one day, and he runs into this little group of blonde-haired, fair-skinned boys, um, and he asks one of his uh, attendants, you know, who is that? And they say that they're called um, Angli, right? Mm -hmm. Angles. Um, and Pope Gregory makes like, you know, the super dad joke about it and says, oh, they're not angles, they're angels. And it's a shame that these angels shouldn't be uh, allowed into the kingdom of heaven. Right. And so like um, for Bede, you know, this is a moment of almost like, you know, it's almost like Isidore Seville loving these terrible etymological puns, uh, which are also near and dear to my heart um, <laughs> that, you know, because this pun exists between angel and angle that somehow like in God's plan for humanity, like mm -hmm. these people have been appointed to be, um, to belong to heaven in a sense. Um, and so it's because of that pun um, that, you know, Pope Gregory thinks it's worth sending missionaries in the first place to become a real priority for him. Um, and, and be, so yeah, so, so you, you asked about Rome, uh, and England here, Bede is very, he sees Rome as, you know, sort of the the foster parent of the English church. Um, and his, his loyalty is always to Rome. Um, part of that is because, you know, Rome is considered to be the seat of St. Peter, right? And, you know, in scripture, Christ tells Peter, uh, you're Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will found my church. Right. Um, so B thinks, well, the one true church has to be whatever Rome says, basically. Right. Because Rome is Peter. Um, and so this is where, like, when you wade into the climax of the ecclesiastical history. Right. He's very worried about the date of Easter. Um, yeah. Which... Yeah. That was what is the stress, but Thank you for bringing that up, because it does have some good points. Like, why is Easter celebrated on different days every year? Like, why is it not the same? not on the same date it makes and it does make some good points in in his writing when it comes to easter he does i believe he dedicate a whole chapter to this as well oh yeah oh yeah it's very important to him he also writes a treatise on how to reckon time um exactly and he also is a he's probably the medieval expert on what's called computus which is like the whole mathematical discipline devoted to calculating easter correctly easter is a movable feast um because you know the christian easter is based on um the jewish passover which you know there's a lunar um cycle there for calculating times um and, and seasons and things and so you know passover is also also drifts all over the place um and so does easter because it follows the phases of the moon rather than you know the the our modern 365 day calendar so it's not on the same date um for bead you know and this is one of those things that like when i talk to students about it i i kind of make fun of b a little bit you know and they think it's they think it's ridiculous so like, why is he so fixated on easter why is easter such a big deal right like yeah. um and especially if you don't have come from a religious background, you know, like, why wasn't Christmas a bigger deal might be your question from a modern perspective. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is where I can I can come in and say, well, Easter was like the most single most important event in history. Because of the death of Christ, right? More the death of Christ, but more importantly, the resurrection of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Um for them, it was all one sort of unit, right? Like Easter weekend all kind of went together. Good Friday was Christ dying, but then, and then Saturday is the harrowing of hell, which, you know, if you want to learn about that, read my book when it comes out in 2025. Um, <laughs> and then the resurrection, of course, is what allows everyone to become Christians theoretically after that, right? Um, and so that's why it's very important to Bede and to the church in his day. Um, but, but I think Bede is extra bothered with the fact that well, there's a lot going on. You might think that he just doesn't like um, the Irish church, which is not actually the case. He had lots of interactions with Irish church leaders. Um, they came and visited his monastery. They had good relations. And, you know, even on the continent, right, in Francia, um, 
the Irish and the English are working together to try to convert the Saxons and other people. Um, I do believe, and it, I've been discussed this, I think, in our episode of Charlemagne, that there were Irish present in Charlemagne's court as well. So there were obviously religious relations. And yeah, this and is quite a distance from Arkin to Ireland. So you can see, you know, it, they, they, there were obviously good relations even under the age of Charlemagne with the Irish church as well. Yeah, so it didn't totally spoil things. But that said, Bede gets really touchy about this. Um, actually, he gets touchy about two things at the same time, right? So all of this sort of culminates around the Synod of Whitby. Um, and and that's that's the big church council that they have where they say, okay, we've got to figure out this Easter question and when we're going to celebrate it. Um, are we going to do what the Irish church is doing or are we going to do what Rome is doing, right? And there's this, this Synod goes on for quite a while, right? There are, it's days and days and days of debating over this issue. Um, Bede is also upset about haircuts, right? <laughs> He's also <laughs> upset about should English monks get the Irish style tonsure or should they do the tonsure that they do in Rome, right? Again, I think we need to take a step back and just realize that Bede is worried about symbolic relationships here more than anything, I think. He, the reason he's getting worked up is not because, you know, the haircut itself is so important. But again, he sees Rome as a stand-in for Peter, right? And Peter is the disciple that Christ says, you know, uh, he, he says that you'll have the authority to bind and loosen things in heaven, right? You've got the keys to the gates of heaven, basically. So for Bede and his understanding, and, and you know, if you read his scriptural commentaries as well, some of which are translated into English and many of which are not, um, you know, he sees salvation and being on Peter's good side as, you know, inherently linked. Um, so this is why he's so worried about it is he wants the English church to be aligned with Rome rather than Ireland because Rome is the one where the apostolic tradition and authority comes from. Um, and I think on a symbolic level, too, it's it's he's really upset that the church, which is supposed to be a single, you know, the bride of Christ singular is split on this issue. Um, you know, it, he he seems to think that it's um, it's inappropriate for Christians to dispute like the date of the most important event in their history. Right. Mm -hmm. Surely they can agree on that. Um, but they don't and they can't. And they wind up siding with Rome and Bede is very happy with this. You know, this is the climax of the ecclesiastical history. And it's a happy ending as far as he's concerned with that issue. Um, but yeah, but there's always like there's a lot of I think this is one of those moments in the ecclesiastical history where Bede's anxiety about the status of the English church, about their status as a chosen people. He doesn't think it's permanent. He, he thinks that he, they could lose it. Right. Because the way that he reads the Hebrew scriptures, you know, um, Israel lost their favored status too, right? And and uh, this goes back to some early Christian ways of interpreting um, both the Bible and world history. But um, there's what they call supersessionism, right? The idea that Israel was superseded, that it was replaced. There was an old covenant that God made with them. And because they didn't obey and they didn't... Um, they didn't see Christ as the Messiah. They turned their backs on him. You know, therefore, God said, OK, we're not going to go salvation down that route. We're going to start this new thing with Christianity. Um, so. I think in Bede's um, understanding, England is in a special place and they are sort of a new Israel. But that means that they can also screw it up and they can also lose their land and their favor as well. So a lot of this anxiety comes back to he doesn't want to get overrun by the heathens around him because there are heathens around him right the conversion's not done yet and as I mentioned heathens and one of the heathens around them of course were the pits or as we know today is the Scots. and he does write about how the pits were were as well christianized and how christianity came to the pits which was a little bit later than the english english people yeah yeah and, and i mean and this is something that you know you asked me to think about even before coming on here, um, because I, you know, in some articles that I'm working on, I'm trying to get at what is the anxiety that Bede feels, and not just Bede, but the English in general, uh, feel about their salvation. Um, you know, 
Veed is at great pains to show a smooth, triumphant, um, inevitable conversion of England, right? Um, mm -hmm. He wants it to be a narrative of triumph, um, which like fair, you know, that's his team he's rooting for. Um, so the way that he describes it in 597, uh, Augustine comes up and through some miraculous intervention, he convinces King Athelbert of Kent to convert, you know, Athelbert becomes the first Christian king. Um, and then, you know, it's sort of a slow, steady series of victories yeah. as Christianity marches north across England. Do, um, do, we, know, do we know if the Christianization of uh, the English people or the Anglo-Saxons, I suppose, is a more correct term, do we know if that it was kind of a Charlemagne version where, where you know, you become Christian or you get your head cut off or, or was it, you know, like, like you know, just voluntarily so like, so like, uh, like oh. I said, it's not a static conversion. Like you, you can do this, but you don't have to kind of thing. Yeah, so that's, it's an open question. Um, to some extent, you know, it's not like, it's not like Charlemagne where they're converting people at the point of the sword sometimes, right? Mm. Um, I mean, there's a little bit, that's the thing is, we have Bede's account and then not a lot else. We do have some archaeological evidence and we have some like, you know, like the life of St. Wilfred, which is an incredibly unreliable uh, historical mm -hmm. document, right? It, it's pure propaganda. Um, but Wilfred is kind of infamous for being a pretty worldly bishop, right? Mm -hmm. He um, he travels around with a band of warrior retainers, right? Uh, kind of like a Germanic leader would, like in Beowulf or something, right? Uh, we don't know if he used those troops like to enforce his rulings or whatever right but at the very least he wanted to look like that kind of guy um and bead is careful to sort of tiptoe around this uh he does censure some contemporary kings um actually his view of history seems to get less rosy the more he looks to his immediate um present right <laughs> like like when he looks in the deep past it's with lots of nostalgia at how wonderful the english church was in its first flower um but then as we get down to the present day you know we get a little more decadent and uh he's worried about you know he's trying to warn the kings around him not to mess this up don't be apostates he gives us examples of what happens to some apostate kings you know they suffer horrible um deaths as they deserve and and that's sort of a veiled threat right like you need to get your acts together or else this will happen to you and to england too right um so i, I think the conversion i mean the one way to get at this question is you know who converts when we say that parts of england are converted right and the question of conversion in the early middle ages is 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 kind of um it's hard to assess anyway, right? I mean, it's hard to tell yeah. when one individual person converts, right? Um, they can tell you, but like, you know, looking at the evidence in their life, it's 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 an open question sometimes. But anyway, um, what I can say is, you know, if King Athelbert converts and his household converts in 597 or a few years after that, um, does that mean that every person in Kent was suddenly a Christian individually? Certainly not, right? <laughs> That's yeah. not how. Like, just because your your leader, your political leader, accepts a faith, it's not like a trickle down thing, right? Especially the way that yeah. Christianity was understood then, as well as now, as a uh, to some extent a matter of the individual and their heart, right? Like, and, and not... I mean, again, I want to bring bring this up. We spoke about in the his, our episode a while ago, a few years ago, now, I think, on the Holy Roman Empire. We spoke about how mainly the elite were Christians in the early days, and how it's mainly, and I mean that kind of makes sense. I consider the Bible was in Latin; you need to understand Latin to a certain extent to, quote unquote, enjoy, enjoy the Bible and the what the meaning is. Because if you didn't understand what what are they saying, what is this thing that you know, what are they talking about? So you needed to understand Latin to a certain extent, and it was mainly at this at least in Alemannia at the time. It was mainly for the elite. Was this the case in England as well? But mainly it was some, Christianity was somewhat. a concern for and for the elite. Somewhat. I mean, there it does eventually work its way down as the thing. It just takes longer. So that's mm -hmm. what I mean by like when I say like so. Okay, the king may have converted in this year, but it may have taken decades for the mm -hmm. countryside in his area. You know, I think the mentality was um, when a king converts, suddenly they're. Their territory is Christian, so now it's up to them to sort of take care of their own household 
as it were, right? They need to start funding churches, founding monasteries, paying for parishes, and priests who can then go out and educate and convert the uh, the laity, right? Um, and I think that sort of mission indirectly was near and dear to Bede's heart. Um, I think that's a good explanation for for like, why does he devote? First off, why isn't he ambitious? Why doesn't he want to become a bishop? He never shows any sign of wanting to rise higher than a priest. Um, so he's not really interested in worldly power. Um, instead, he just wants to spend all the time teaching and and preaching, which is basically teaching too, right? It's explaining the scriptures. Now, his main thing is Latin, right? He believes that. So there's a little bit of an elitist edge there, right? Um, he's not he's not out like like Aldhelm, for example. We have um, Aldhelm as another early English figure. We have stories about him like going out to bridges, right, which um, crossroads, and starting to like give Old English like recite Old English poetry, you know, like Beowulf or something to draw a large crowd, and then suddenly switching and preaching to them in the vernacular um, to to help convert, right? So Bede's not out there doing that sort of. Um, you know, missionary grunt work. But when you think about what he was doing, he is building an incredibly strong infrastructure that can train other people who will go do that sort of thing, right? So yeah, he's a little bit in the ivory tower, as it were, writing all these books in Latin. And yes, in his writing, sometimes he gets grumpy at the English for, you know, being English, um, being monolingual, right? <laughs> he gets frustrated that these lazy English um, around him aren't better at Latin. Um, so he does reluctantly translate. Um, I mean, he writes the ecclesiastical history in Latin. Somebody translates it into Old English. Um, after that, we have like, I don't know, eight copies maybe of the ecclesiastical history in Old English versus like 200 <laughs> in Latin. Um, but, you know, that sort of shows the importance of it in the local area. Supposedly, Bede is trying to work on a translation of the Gospel of John into Old English um, as he's dying, like in his last few months of life. That was something that that um, his disciple Cuthbert tells us that he was working on. Unfortunately, we don't have even a word of that that survives. So if it's true, it's been lost to the sands of time, which is really too bad because I would I would pay good money to, to read that, uh, to read Bede's own version of it. Um, yeah, so he's passionate about this thing, um, but it's but I think it's a gradual process. And one oh I know one thing that I was going to say uh, that we talked about uh, many many weeks or maybe even months ago on Twitter was what evidence do we have that the conversion process might have been more violent or messier than Bede wants us to believe, right? Um, in the recently unearthed Staffordshire horde. Um, you know, which was discovered, what, I don't know, 12 years ago now or so, or maybe in 2009, I can't remember. Anyway, um, there is a particular item known as K550. Um, and it is, you can see, you can look it up on the British, uh, actually, if you just Google Staffordshire Ford K550, you'll, you'll find pictures of it. It's this little golden cross um, that's been bent, you know, which we think was done on purpose as it was thrown away into that hoard. Um, but it, it's a little golden cross, and it has a verse from the book of Numbers, from the Hebrew um, Bible, that uh, I believe it's Numbers 23 off the top of my head, that basically says, Lord, let your enemies be destroyed. Um, and the fact that it's on a cross, you know, the archaeologists think no, that that doesn't meant... sound very Christian. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's part of the tension, right, is that, you know... Well, I, what happened to turn on the cheek? I was going to say, Jesus in the gospel is all about <laughs> peace, uh, peaceful resistance, right? Turning the other cheek. He scolds Peter for, for cutting off Malchus's ear uh, when, you know, trying to stop Jesus being arrested. He seems to be peace oriented, but um, that As, as you know, the med medieval Christian church was not so much so. Much so. Yeah, there's this, well, and this is one of the reasons why it's very convenient for them to believe that they are a new Israel is because then all of a sudden you can turn around back to the Hebrew scriptures and read books like the book of Numbers, where Israel is like doing all this military work, right? Like Joshua is leading all these military expeditions. They're out there killing entire towns. Um, you know, it's 
not peaceful. <laughs> um, and so by by typologically saying we are a second Israel, they're giving themselves permission to act like what they see in those books, right? Um, and so, yeah, sort of a convenient rhetorical um, stance that allows them to sidestep the whole Jesus thing. <laughs> hmm. And I, I think the Crusades as well, and and the res result of that, that we see that you know there it's not so much Christian, so so sorry, not so not so much P turning the other cheek, you might say. Yeah, and you see this. I mean, you see this tension all throughout um, church history, really, right? Where um, I don't know what's a what's a fun example. I mean, Erosius, if you read his um, history against the pagans, um, he's writing in the five hundreds. You know, a lot of his um, a lot of his histories are especially when he's talking about what's going on in the church in Gallia and what, what we would think of as France today, there's a lot of violence going on. And he's really outraged that people are getting like, you know, they're trying to seek sanctuary in a church, but they're getting murdered anyway. Like he, he recognizes that this kind of violence shouldn't be going on. And he, you know, speaks out against it. But the fact that it's happening shows you that not everyone's on board with that message. Right. Um, or even if we turn to like the old Saxon Halion, right. Um, that poem which is technically retelling the gospels um you know in the halion jesus is not violent which is great mm -hmm. right that's yeah. accurate um but it is trying to tell his story in a germanic heroic beowulf mm -hmm. kind of style and there's this this notorious passage where peter cuts the guy's ear off and like you can tell that like the the translator is like oh finally like some violence like mm -hmm. you know he talks about how peter's like swelling with rage and he brandishes his blade and he cuts mm -hmm. the guy's ear off and the blood shoots everywhere right mm -hmm. um that's not in the bible but <laughs> but there's this this tension even in a monk who's trying to translate this thing as a missionary tool right because that's what a halion was translated into old saxon um he can't help it right like that that there's that that cultural element of reveling and heroic violence that is like you know it bubbles to the surface even though he's supposed to be um turning the other cheek and then jesus can rush back in and put the ear back on and say no 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 no, don't do that um <laughs> but but it's not the highlight of the moment right <laughs> so um, yeah so it's uh, something yeah, that caught, kind of caught my attention as well was you know the little boy who being right about this little boy who went who got cured by fever in a in this town by the way he went to this bishop, I think I don't remember his name, and then, you know, oh, he went to this well, and he got cured. Suddenly, hallelujah, he is uh, well again, and then, praise God, praise Christianity. And again, you see this praising of how, I just have a little faith, and you, everything is going to go well with you. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as to say, like, I think Bede would say that that's going too far, right? Not everything mm. will go well just because you're Christian, but he does provide, you know, miracles as evidence that God does work to try to fix this messed up broken world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think some, you know, yeah, Bede's worldview is, is tempered, right. He's not, he is triumphalist. He wants to see Christianity spread absolutely everywhere forever and ever. Amen. Right. Um, <laughs> that's why he does what he does, but you know, he does, he tells us about, um, he tells us things that he doesn't have to tell us, right. He tells us that there are Kings who apost who, who are apostates who give up on the faith and turn their back on it. Right. That's kind of embarrassing to the church. Um, he does admit when certain ecclesiastics sort of break or bend the rules. Right. Um, he's not, he's not just trying to give us this like pristine image that's completely idealized, right? And this is one of the reasons why we respect him as a historian is he seems to, at least to a limited extent, he wants to tell the truth even when it's inconvenient. Um, theologically, right, how he handles that, I think uh, just goes back to what we were just talking about by saying that there's this tension of being divinely chosen and singled out as English, but also like we could lose this status if we if we deviate too much, um, yeah. Hmm. And something that is rather significant and important with Bean as well, I believe he's one of the first to call the English people English, as we mentioned, Angles, which then again becomes the English people. He's one of the first people who actually 
course, then the English people, and I mean, I don't know to what extent it means, but it's, you know, is it what you consider modern England today or just Britannia as a whole? But, you know, it is rather significant that he kind of be this where we get this name from, England. Yeah, I mean, the title is, you know, the ecclesiastical, the ecclesiastical history of the, he says Anglorum, right? The genitive mm. plural there in Latin of the Angles, of the English. Um, yeah, um, well, I'm trying to think. So, um, yeah, he, yeah, he, he does help to popularize the label in that way. Um, because especially early on, right, England is not a coherent political or even ethnic, mm. um, you know, it's, there's all sorts of diversity, right? There's the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes that Bede tells us about. There's more than that, too, right? There's the Merchants. You have Northumbria, you have Saxony, you have... Mercians, you have the Huicha, yeah. you have all these little little peoples from all over the place, right? Not to mention the Romano-Celts and the Picts and the Irish, who he calls the Scoti, right? The Scots. Um, at some point in history, those two flip-flop. But anyway, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of complexity in early medieval England, right? Which is why mm. a lot of people in the field are moving away from calling it Anglo-Saxon England because, you know, that that's really reduces the complexity that was there. Um, and yeah, so so Bede, Bede wants us to see a single unified nation because that's part of his narrative about, you know, being the single elect nation that, that God is setting up to, to help missionize the rest of the world, the ends of the world. But um but it is it is very much an artifact, especially in his day, right? There are still, you know, at least the heptarchy, at least the seven kingdoms, maybe even more jostling for power in Bede's own day. Um, we don't get, I mean, Alfred the Great, you know, he's considered the great because he's the first king over all those kingdoms, right? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think even that the modern England that we think about today, not to bring Great Britain, but in the not to think about it today, not even under William the Conqueror would we see something similar or the late, like later, but just not until the later Plantagenet lines would we see what we consider modern. I don't remember when, don't ask me what time, but it's not in the late Plantagenet lines that we see the creation of Wales, Scotland, or the modern, what we think about as modern England today. So it's really not. Until the yeah, Nor several England, centuries Nor that we see than what we think about as modern England today. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot more fragmentary, a lot more complicated, um, a lot of local centers of power, right? Sort of vying with mm -hmm. each other uh, in a sort of Games of Thronesy kind of way almost. Um, <laughs> rather than being, like you said, a single entity that we that we think about today, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so but if he is like you said significant that he gives us the modern term English and in the English people. So he is significant in that sense as well. I don't know what we would, would call it if we if he didn't call it the uh, as we introduce the English term, the English the a classical history of the English people. I don't know what we would have called in today for the today is but it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know if they would have stuck with Britannia or something, but yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it, I think because his work is so overwhelmingly popular and influential, like I don't, we don't know what they were calling themselves yeah. or whether they just like would have called themselves, you know, oh, I'm Northumbrian or oh, I'm, yeah. you know, from from the Isle of Wight or something, right? Yeah. Um, we don't have a ton of evidence as the thing, um for those kinds of local distinctions um but yeah i think eventually the term does win out and it does stick because probably because of bead um you know because he's just so so popular and so widely revered i mean even by the time we get to dante in italy 500 years later five or 600 years later right dante is still in awe of Bede and considers him one of the great church fathers, one of the great doctors of the church, um, and puts him in paradise, right, it, it, unambiguously in the Divine Comedy. So, you know, his reputation was international and long-lasting. Um, yeah, so like you said, like that's probably a good, uh, major factor in why we call England, England, and the English rather than something else. I mean, you mentioned his popularity, but I would say that for someone who might not be familiar with 
and I think that goes for a few of my good listeners as well. I'm sorry for sorry to the listeners who might be offended by this, but you know, it's he isn't really that popular outside academic work. I think he's not. He's uh, but he's not snorry to put it that way, and he he's certainly I would say is he up until I read Mark Morris' work on Adam's actions, I certainly haven't heard about Bead as a historical source, and. Well, and recently, when I read it, it's I wouldn't say he is that popular outside academic work. Or if you are really interested in the in the Anglo-Saxon world, you wouldn't probably wouldn't have heard of him. Right? Yeah, what, what what famous means um varies greatly <laughs> by <laughs> what kind of person you are, right? I mean, you just mentioned Snorri. Snorri is very famous in the Scandinavian world, but like. He's probably less, I would say, probably less famous than Bede, depending on what your tradition is, right? Mm-hmm. And Bede is famous, like, in academic circles. But, like, yeah, you're right. Like, average people probably have no clue who Bede is unless they're listening to this podcast and finding out, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he's famous, asterisk, um, for an early medieval dude, right? Um, <laughs> certainly more well-known than, I don't know, his contemporaries, like Benedict Bishop um, or, you know, Alwyn of York. Like they're also important for their day, but they're even more niche, even more specialized. Mm. Now, then I don't know if you remember to forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but I want to talk about his reliability because as mm. and I do think we spoke, spoke about this in, in our episode again on with on Anglo Saxons that we did last year. But he is, is kind of unreliable early on in his work because you know he's writing centuries. For several centuries, he's writing up until his time, so he's uh, kind of unreliable early on in his work. But yeah. as you, you spoke about, he does interview several bishops and uh, and priests and other people who, in his time that he gained his sources from. As we go on, in later in the book, he does he, he does have contacts there that it makes him more reliable later on. But in in the early works, he is not so reliable but he is from like we said stated earlier on he's one of the few stories we have so we can't have, we can't take his word for it but you know he is uh kind of the only source we have outside archaeological evidence yeah yeah i mean i think if we're going to give him credit you know he tried his best um he also <laughs> had very few sources to work with too right so you know when it comes to like the Germanic uh, tribes coming over, right? That's, I think that's probably where we can say that he is least reliable. Um, And to some extent, you know, like you said, he's reporting news that is 200 years old at this point. Um, All that survives is oral tradition and then whatever he can make of Gildas, um, which is, you know, again, famously difficult to decipher, uh, even in Latin, right? Even if you're really good with Latin, Gildas just is hard to follow. He's really vague all the time. He's just, he's very, um, excitable we'll say he's very excitable and it's hard to figure out what he's saying so you know you think yeah bead has a, he sort of simplifies the narrative we don't know if um i'm trying to think now um you mentioned mark morris i'm trying to think about what he says about bead um you know there's the idea that maybe bead is passing on an oral tradition right um because bead mentions three ships specifically um that yeah. come over um and that that's kind of a, a stock um, folkloric um, description of like where the, when when founders come over to England, you know, each little region has like their famous founders who come over on a ships. They often come over on three ships or they come as an alliterating pair of brothers like Hengist and Borsa, right, which mm. just means horse and stallion, right? Like, so like they're probably like were they probably brothers who are named that? Mm, probably not, you know, but it is part of the Germanic heroic oral tradition to have mm-hmm. these dy- dynasties that have alliterating names, you know, like Hrothgar and his sons who all start with H. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there, the, it's hard to tell like sort of where the Germanic legendary past blurs with actual, what we would consider actual factual history. Um, but, you know, that distinction wasn't quite as important to them. Mm-hmm. Um you know, the, the, I mean, I'm sure that Bede would have said that, like, yeah, where we have a written source, I'm going to trust that more, right? Um, but where we don't have a written source, we can fill it in with with legend, right? Um, mm-hmm. But, the, but they, yeah, I mean, the standards were different then. Honestly, Bede is 
has much higher standards than some of his contemporaries would have, right? Mm -hmm. That's why he was famous then and 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 continued to be, right? Because he was he did have much higher standards. Um, he was trying his best with a very very limited corpus of data. Right? And 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 yeah, to mention Mark Morris, I discussed with him when I before I read Bead that you know I'm going to read Bead and you know uh, what should I expect? And he spoke about how. You know, this was after we recorded our Norman Conquest episode, but, you know, he Bede writes about, oh, this battle happened, but it doesn't explain, you know, how the battle happened or what in the battle. He just say in detail, he just writes about, oh, this battle happened and that's it. And it, this tribe won. It doesn't explain. Yeah. And the, this kind of goes from primary sources in general, I think, if you don't read primary sources, they don't where you wish, you know, you know him more about, for example, hygienic or day-to-day -day life, it didn't really concern the writers at the time because, you know, for them, it was kind of, uh, you know, obvious to them what daily life was, so they didn't feel like they, every, to everyone, this was the, the pattern is the same, so it wasn't their concern to write about, for example, daily life or how this battle was fought or how this thing yeah. happened. Yeah, they usually... Didn't... Yeah, I was going to say, usually when we get those kinds of incidental details, it's usually seems kind of accidental, right? Like, yeah. if one of Bede's narrative happens to mention that someone wore a certain style of clothing, like, yeah. he's not telling us that because he's an anthropologist interested in describing his own culture, yeah. right? It just happens to be important to this one moment in this one story, and so we can sort of glean some information from that. I think the, the question of battles is an interesting one, um, and again, I'm not a historian, I'm just a literary historian guy, um, but... I do think a lot about Germanic epic poetry and sort of how they talk about battles. Um, you know, we have a couple of old English poems like the Battle of Malden, the Battle of Brunenburg, um, where, and of course there are old Norse poems, tons of them, Scaldic ones especially, that commemorate battles. Um, they're all very vague, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Brunenburg and Malden are maybe some of the the most detailed ones um, in terms of discussing like the dynamics of where troops were. But really all they say is, you know, the king routed the Scots and was shooting at the Scots. Um, and then the Sa Wichingas, the Sea Vikings fled, right? Um, when you think about how, okay, uh, full disclosure, I personally have never been in a battle. Um, <laughs> but you have me but when you think, <laughs> right. Probably of many of our listeners, except for unless they're veterans, right, have not actually been in a real life battle. But when you think about just the chaos that would be involved in something like that, mm. um, you know, there are medieval descriptions of battles where, like, it seems like people were never even sure if the battle was over yet or not, right? Yeah. Um, like, like, how would you judge that in the moment? Um, when does one side finally say, like, okay, we're actually done killing each other now? Um, are we allowed to run away? Are you going to chase us? Right? Like, so, like, if you just think about how chaotic and ridiculously hard to figure yeah. out it would be for for an actual eyewitness who was there to tell you what happened, yeah. unless they were a leader in charge, like, how would they know? Right? So, yeah, for by, by, the, by the time you're a bead and you're a historian who's reporting it, I think all that really matters is they had a battle at this place, these guys won, right? Because politically, that's the fact that remains. Yeah, and I don't know if you've seen the show, but there's a, this Scandinavian show, and it's in English as well, on Norse, on Netflix, it's called Norseman. And there's this great joke in, in season three, I think, where this guy, guy says, say, how, so how did you go? How many enemies did you kill or something? And then the guy answers, well, I basically just killed everyone I saw on this battle scene. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, as well, it didn't really, it was, should have been easy to, to distinguish as a joke in Norseman says, you know, like he just killed anyone he saw in, in the battlefield. It, it shouldn't have been easy as well to distinguish this one from enemy to is this yeah. guy a friend as well, you know. It, it wasn't like, a, oh, that guy's wearing red, he's definitely an enemy, or this guy's wearing, you know, not our flag banner. It's, you, you shouldn't see that easily in a battle and full scale armor. It wasn't easy to see what, from, I can't imagine it had could have been easy to see who were enemy or who were friend, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, you know, if they've got the headgear on, they've got mail on, it's hot and heavy mm. and yeah, confusing for sure. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I would say that in the interest of being generous, he does the best with what he has. Mm. Um, you know, he's not as fancy 
helpful as some like later historians like Geoffrey of Monmouth, who might actually give us a lot more detail about a battle or something, but is very clearly embellishing, you know, for the sake of telling a good tale. Um, we don't get much of that from Bede. I think the furthest that Bede is going to veer into the fantastic or something like that is when he's reporting a miracle, right? Which I don't think he, he would not have thought of that as fantastic, right? He just would have said, well, my Christian faith tells me that sometimes God works miracles, right? So that's not that's not outlandish. Um, but also when he reports, there are a couple of moments that I'm particularly fond of where he reports um, visions of the afterlife, right? Um, where someone has a fever or something and, and they almost die, right? They seem to have like a near-death experience and they get a tour of, of hell um, and they come back and tell us about it, right? There's the vision of Fursa in particular. Um, that Bede does report, which it, to me is like one of those interesting moments where it seems like Bede is, you know, maybe he would have said, well, it's just a miracle, right? That miracles happen. Um, but to me, it does seem like one of those few moments where Bede does kind of step to the edge of of historical credibility. And it, it's, it's interesting. I think we got to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for coming on. This I mean, Absolutely. It's great we have been talking about the Winter Rebel Bede. Do you have anything else you want to promote? And so links you want me to put in the description. And of course, you should absolutely follow this guy on Twitter or X, whatever you should supposed to call it these days. So <laughs> where do you have any social media, anything you want to promote or any links you want me to put in the description? Well, like you said, you can find me on the site formerly known as Twitter under the uh, handle at Phil underscore lol underscore logist right philologist uh emphasis on the lol um and you mentioned my you, you were kind enough to mention my book uh that'll be coming out from manchester university press in 2025 so that's going to be all about translations of hell uh in the early middle ages in old english old norse middle welsh and old irish um yeah otherwise i guess you could go on google scholar and look up my dry academic stuff if you want to learn more about old english heroic poetry or uh biblical apocrypha <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and it's been a pleasure to talk with you. My name is Alan. This has been with that H Twelve. We are available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you're on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please consider writing a review and give us five stars. If you're on Spotify, that would help us out a lot. Please like, share, and subscribe. We are always also available on Instagram and on that page 12 and on Twitter and don't call it Twitter still. It's never going to be X for me. So we are on the red that age 12. And thank you for so much for listening. Please check out some other episodes and I'll see you next time.